Welcome to our final study of the Sermon on the Mount. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you and you're ready to read. We're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Um, we'll get there in just a minute. I want to begin uh, by suggesting that you imagine that you are driving down the road in your car and all of a sudden you see off in the horizon, you see bright yellow lights flashing. Arrow points you to one to off to the to the to the inside lane. As you get closer, you see warning signs that say slow down. You see signs that say um, road construction. All these are warning signs that we put on our roads to help people to navigate so they can get get around things and get safe, get get to where they need to safety. What happens if we don't pay attention to warning signs? Well, we end up in a wreck. We end up hurt, or maybe even worse, we end up dead. And so it's important that we pay war pay attention to warning signs. Jesus, he's been giving us a bunch of really good stuff to live by in the Sermon on the Mount. He's given us a whole lot of things that are really challenging and really important for us to remember. But as he gets to the end, I think, and I like to describe this section as the warning signs section because he's trying to get us to pay attention to some things that we need to be careful of or we're going to get derailed and we could really mess ourselves up in our walk with God. So be looking for that. We're going to be looking at three specific things that he brings out. Be looking for that as we read through the text just now. I'm going to read from the New International Version as we've done in the past, followed by the message paraphrase. So follow along with me as you read in your Bible and I read it, read from mine, Matthew 7, 13 through 23, the New International Version. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistle? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many say, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell you plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. And again, we'll read the text from the message. Again, verse 13. Do not look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The only way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practice sincerity. Chances are they're out to rip you off the sum off some way or another. Don't be impressed by their charisma. Look for character. Who preaches are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. These diseased trees with their bad apples are going to be chopped down and burned. Knowing the correct password saying, Master, Master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is obedience, doing what my Father wills. I can see it all now. At the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached the message. We bashed the demons. Our sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. Get out of here. See the warning signs there? As Jesus gets to the end of this sermon, he's trying to get us to be careful. 
He's given us some tough messages and some tough things we need to do, but he gives us what I believe are three warning signs that we need to pay attention to. The first one is found in verses 13 and 14. And he's talking about getting through the gate. Um, he talks about a wide gate and a narrow, a wide path and a narrow gate. Many times when people read this, they want to talk about heaven and hell. But it's interesting in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talked about the kingdom of heaven. He's talked about things like this before. And you know what he's usually, what he's always talking about is not what's going to happen way off in the future. He's not talking about heaven or hell. He's talking about how we live today in God's kingdom, how we submit to God and his rules now. I think what he's talking about when we look at this text, and I, I challenge you to look, read through the text carefully, he's talking about how we live our lives. That the temptation is to do the easy way of submitting to God, where in fact he's calling us through the Sermon on the Mount to do something that's hard, and that a lot of people are going to bail on doing what the Sermon on the Mount says. But the easy way is, well, there's quick fixes. And you can find the quick fix books, a dollar a dozen at the bookstores. But the real hard stuff to do is sometimes are just as simple as things like the Sermon on the Mount. Loving your neighbor. Are you kidding me? That's not easy. That's tough stuff. And a lot of people will say, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to do what the Bible says. But he challenges us to, to go through, through the narrow gate. He's calling us to intentionally do what's difficult. Why? Because there's real life that's involved. Because there's a real relationship with God that can be achieved through this. And that's not done through quick fixes. It's come, it comes through total submission. It comes through really working at it and being intentional in what we do. Second point he brings out here. He challenges us to to be warned about false prophets. He gives us an alert here in verses 15 through 20. He talks in the text about wolves in sheep's clothing. I always think back to the Roadrunner cartoon when I see this because you have in there the epic uh, wily e. coyote and what does he do? He's that wolf. Well, he's a coyote, I know, but he puts on sheep's clothing to try to get to the sheep and the big old sheep dog, he doesn't fall for it. You see, there's false teachers out there who practice what they do, and they, well, they're self-serving. And his message in this text isn't so much to identify the false teachers, but saying, keep your guard up because people are going to try to mislead you. I, it, it, we can real easily get sidetracked by people trying to mislead us. And we can easily get sidetracked by being wor so worried about the false prophets. But what's he saying? This is a tough thing to do. Warning sign, don't get derailed by messages that are going to sidetrack you from what I really want you to do. But stay diligent about it. Stay focused. Be good plants, good trees, good fruit, rather than bad. Third point he brings out here, the third warning sign. And he challenges us to be a true disciple. This one, the third one here, as he gets into in verses 21 through 24, i got to be honest, it makes me uncomfortable, probably more than the other two. Um, because what he challenges us to do is really look, why are you doing what you're doing? Okay, he's given us a whole bunch of stuff that we need to do in the Sermon on the Mount, but what does he say? Make sure you're doing it out of God's will, not your own glory. Because otherwise, come Judgment Day, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to stand before him, and he's going to go, you were doing a lot of good stuff, but you did it for the wrong reason. It makes me stop and ask, why do I go to worship? Is it for my own pleasure? Is it for my own comfort? Is it because this is going to make me happy, or is it really to bow down and worship him? Is it really to submit to him? Um, it's interesting, and during COVID, we've enjoyed worship at home, many of us, I get up, my sweatpants or shorts, and walk around the house, make a cup of coffee, sit down and push play on the video, and I'm cozy and I'm comfortable. I'm having my coffee, got my church, got my God, and, and worship is easy and it's fun. And now as we come near the end of COVID, we're going to have to come, come and worship him. And we're being called, put on your pants, put on your shoes. Maybe even sing with a mask on. Maybe even do some things that are uncomfortable for you. 
make a sacrifice for worship. And why do I do it? Because I wanted to submit to God. I want to do, I, I, I'm just so privileged to get to worship him. Why do I, and you can start filling in blanks. Being a true disciple is asking, what is God's will and how can I, how can I submit to him? Now, the challenge in this is to really ask yourself, what is God's will? Well, God wants us to submit to him. He wants us to draw near to him. He wants us to use what we have for him. I think that's what he's talking about. And we can get sidetracked and make it our will and be selfish about it. How do you use God? How do you make God's will a part of your life? How do you make sure that you use your talents and gifts? That is at the heart of being a true disciple. And the warning sign that he's given us is don't get sidetracked by your will, but make sure you follow my will. How can you become an en a better engineer that submits to God's will? And use your gifts and talents to serve him and to glorify him. That's where it gets tough. That's where it gets personal. Because if I take my eyes off him and make it all on me, what's going to happen? Well, I can stand before him at judgment and him have him shake his head. And that, boy, I tell you what, that makes me uncomfortable. Because I can get wrapped up in stuff and doing things for him. But I forget, oh, this is about something more than me. Reading your Bible going to church, serving other people. You can fill in the blank. Make sure you're doing it out of submission to his will and not for your own appeasement of your conscience or is making self-serving wills. Three warning signs. Sermon on the Mount's filled with a bunch of really interesting things and challenge you. Spend some time, go back over, look over. We've talked about in, in our previous 11 lessons a lot of stuff. Go back over and look at those. Spend some time, again, rereading the Sermon on the Mount. And here's where, in the practical part that I want to give, I always try to put a, a practical part in it. The last, and, and to me, maybe the most important thing about the Sermon on the Mount is it's intended for us to live. It's intended for us to do. Now go do it. Part of me wanted to, okay, I need to make sure I give them some really good books before I conclude this, because I've read a lot of books about Sermon on the Mount. Tell you what, reading books is an easy thing. Reading books is a wide path. Living the Sermon on the Mount, that path gets real narrow. It gets hard. And so more than giving you books to read, and if you want to read a book on the Sermon on the Mount, that's okay. I think that's good. I did, and I encourage you to read some books on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you want to know some, let me know. I can, I've can. i mentioned several, but I'll be glad to share with you some. But more than reading books about the Sermon on the Mount... My challenge for you is to do it, to live it, and actually allow it to transform your life and draw you nearer to God, your Creator. Allow it to make you, to allow you to experience the power of His love. And that, to me, is, is really what this is all about. So, how do you do that? Real simple. Open up your Bible and go back and start in Matthew chapter 5 and read through chapter 7. Read, read through verse 29 of chapter 7, starting Matthew 1, Matthew 5, 1. And as you read, make notes and want things that you're going, whoa, I need to do that. That's one I'm not doing very well in. There's a lot of stories, a lot of interesting things, as we've talked about already. But try to identify two, maybe three things that, at the most that you really recognize, that's one I can work on. And then spend some time focused on that. As much as I think we need to read the Sermon on the Mount, don't um, please understand, I think we need to read it. But the Sermon on the Mount was meant to transform our lives. It's meant to be something that we do. And so make sure you get out and do it. Make sure you live the Sermon on the Mount. I'm convinced that if we will start living the Sermon on the Mount, it will transform our worlds, let alone our lives. Let's make a difference here in Longmont. Let's make a difference here in Colorado, in our world, by living out the Sermon on the Mount. As always, if you need, if you want to talk more about this, if you want some ideas, you can contact me, Daryl Miller at long at Daryl D A R Y L at LongmontCoc.org. Please give me a drop me an email. I would love to hear not just your questions, but hear how God is transforming your life. How is God working on you through the way you're living the Sermon on the Mount? 
I'm glad you spent some time, and I'm glad we were able to share some, some information about the Sermon on the Mount. My prayer now is that as I, as I finish these videos and I end this series, that it will be transformational in your life. Thanks for taking the time. May God bless you, and may you even draw nearer to Him than ever before.